Welcome to Dead Man Talking. Tonight's show is another fantastic thrill ride and adventure from the wonderful mind of Head of Spectre. As ever, please do let us know down below in the comments what you thought. Please do like and share, it really does help with the channel and our community further. And of course, don't forget to hashtag Team Fear. And so, without further ado, let's get into tonight's story, entitled Project Nephilim. Let's get straight into that. The following are excerpts recovered from the personal log of one Dr. Jeremy Pfeiffer. Dr. Pfeiffer was one of the leads on the now inactive Project 8502 which was informally designated Project Nephilim. The remains of Dr. Pfeiffer were not recovered during the examination of the facility on Lake Champlain after the events of November 17, 2014, although he is believed to be deceased. This journal was recovered from his personal office and archived in Langley, Virginia. This copy has been modified to only show the relevant information. Some entries were either omitted due to a lack of relevance or due to their contents being accessible only to those with over level 3 clearance. I know I will lose my job for leaking this, but people deserve to know the truth. First entry, Dr. Jeremy Pfeiffer. I've never been to Vermont before. Burlington is a nice little town with its charms. I truly do think that I'll like it here. I arrived at a new lab today. And these facilities are better than I expected. I'd had my doubts about setting up an operation so close to an urban area, but General Hughes has set my concerns to rest. While Burlington is large compared to most places in Vermont, it is smaller than I expected when I was told we'd be near a city. The more I think about it, the more I think that the proximity is a good thing. At the end of the day, we are still human. The nature of the work we'll be undertaking here means that we can never be too far from it but having Burlington just across the lake means that we can still have some form of civilization close by without compromising our privacy. For the first day, it was a fairly informal meet and greet. I met up with the rest of my team and we had a meeting with General Hughes and some of the backers of this project. I couldn't be bothered to remember all of their names either. Representatives of corporate interests. I recognized the names of some of the companies, uh, most of them pharmaceutical. I'm sure that if I asked, They'd all smile and claim that they were happy to fund our research for the betterment of mankind. I'd bet they'd say it without even flinching, but that wouldn't make it any less bullshit. I know that they only care about lining their pockets, but that doesn't matter to me. If this entire project goes to hell and they never see the ROI, I won't lose a bit of sleep. They may be liars, but I am not. The most honest person in that room was one of the suits. I think he was from Redacted, and he had the gall to ask me what exactly it was we were trying to accomplish. I like to think of myself as a calm and rational man, but I might have forgiven myself for striking him. Did he not pay attention at any of the briefings prior to this? I know that Hughes took the time to hold something, and still, I was at least courteous and tried to explain to that poor idiot that we were trying to modify the human genome to induce new traits in living subjects. If successful, this could have some truly outstanding applications. Regrowing lost limbs, cures for all sorts of horrible diseases, and perhaps even more. The man just stared at me like I was insane. I suppose that was justified. If he was asking me such a stupid question, he clearly hadn't seen any of the research that Dr. West had put forward to support her hypothesis. I didn't bother trying to explain it further if he really wanted to know. He could have asked Dr. West herself. And she was in the goddamn room. Hell, she'd even displayed the rats she successfully hybridized with the axotl to regrow several limbs. And there really doesn't seem to be a limit to the human stupidity, and I really shouldn't let it bother me. I have known for years that the suits are too stupid to understand what we do, and they just sit back and ask if they can profit off of it. Damn fools. After our briefing, we were led further into the facility, near where we'll be working. The tech is impressive. 
I can see they spared no expense, and hopefully it will reduce the roadblocks in our work. I did get the opportunity to speak with some of the team, and was thrilled to have the opportunity to finally meet Dr. West in person. Her work is truly exemplary, and I am excited for the opportunity to work with her on what we're tentatively calling Project Nephilim, a biblical reference to the offspring of humans and angels. I suppose that the idea is that we will be bridging the gap between man and God. I can't say I'm too sure about that, but I'm not the one who came up with the name. Regardless, if the rest of the team is up to Dr. West's calibre, working here is going to be very exciting indeed, so long as we don't have to keep dealing with the fucking suits. Day 27 Dr. West, Dr. Cornell, and I have been discussing the best way to move forwards. Our first order of business was going through the process that Dr. West used on our hybrid rats. I knew the basics, but the details were really quite interesting, and from there, we discussed replicating her experiments. The agreement is not to begin human trials just yet. That might prove to be too risky. Dr. Cornell and I both want to properly replicate her experiment as a test run. And Dr. West wants to further hybridize the rats to add COVID genes to see if it affects their intelligence. I don't think we should do it in the same batch, but I've suggested two different batches of rats. One to fully reproduce the axolotl experiment, another to test the COVID genes. And with Dr. West's guidance, we at least have begun to replicate the process. I must admit, her methods are a little gruesome, but I can't argue with the results. The process itself is fairly simple. We just need to introduce the new cells into the brain and spine of the host. The hard part is getting the necessary cells. You can't just take some blood from an axolotl and inject it into a rat. You need to first get a sample of their stem cells and from there develop a large enough sample to actually affect the host. Too little and the effect isn't strong enough. Too much and the host can die. Dr. West and some of her assistants are working out just how to judge and scale the sample to affect larger creatures or possibly nullify the negative effects. Although I can tell that she's not hopeful on the latter front. General Hughes has provided us access to whatever test subjects we need. Rats will suffice as a start for now, but if our experiments prove successful, we will work our way up to pigs and monkeys before we consider human trials. I'm getting ahead of myself though, one step at a time. I'm curious about the COVID experiment. That will be especially interesting. Day 45 Our efforts have continued to yield fruit. Continued observation of samples alpha and beta show very little differences. I think it's safe to say that our replication of Dr. West's experience has been successful. Sample beta is showing regenerative capabilities on par with that of the exotal and identical to those of sample alpha. And there have been unexpected side effects though. Sample beta appears to be showing early signs of developing external gills similar to the exotal. We observed the growths about six days after the injection of cells. This development was not noted on sample alpha, who seems to only have developed the regenerative abilities of the exotal and nothing else. We will continue to observe sample beta and subject them to further experiments to test their ability to function as amphibians. Sample Charlie is another story entirely. Further research is needed, but Sample Charlie shows absolutely no changes in regard to intelligence compared to standard rats. Sample Charlie is being tentatively listed as a failure. Dr. Cornell's secondary experiment on Sample Delta has yielded more fruit, though. His hypothesis is that there is a limit to what we can splice here, and I think he's determined to see where it is. I suspect he didn't think he'd have any results with Delta, but strangely enough, he has. Sample Delta has been given injections from a housefly and has had notable change in the past five days. Their fur has taken on a new texture more closely resembling a housefly. Their movements have grown more erratic and jerky and close examination suggests that the eyes are becoming compounded. Dr. Cornell used multiple injections on this sample and this seems to have yielded better results for him. Dr. West and I have a meeting tomorrow to discuss attempting to create another sample using Corvid genes with Cornell's method. I suspect she'll give me the go-ahead. Day 57 
Sample Epsilon has continued to yield promising results. Dr. Cornell's methods work exactly as planned. We may have figured this out. I watched today as those rats solved puzzles that required reasoning and were otherwise unsolvable by other rats, but were on an appropriate level for a corvid. I should also note the development of feathers and a darker coloration for Sample Epsilon, but that is to be expected. Dr. Cornell has noted that we will need to iron out these additional changes. I agree, but at the very least we have proof of Dr. West's process working when applied to other criteria. All other samples, save for Charlie, have continued to develop as expected. Sample Beta seems to prefer the aquarium to the usual terrarium that other samples are kept in, and it really is a sight to watch those rats swim. Dr. West, Dr. Cornell and I will be having a meeting about moving on to porcine trials next. Dr. Cornell thinks we should wait until we've ironed out the kinks, but I think that we are ready. Dr. Ling, a member of my team, has asked about the vitro injections. I do agree that those would likely yield more promising results, although I am concerned that General Hughes will have an issue with a lengthy gestation period. Dr. Cornell, West and I will have to discuss more in depth during our upcoming meeting. I know that Dr. West supports the in vitro idea. Our subjects are impressive, but it's obvious that they are not entirely comfortable for the modifications that we've made to their bodies. If we decide to utilize the vitro method, we'll need to talk to General Hughes. Day 94 Sample 37 has adapted to the altered genomes far better than I expected. I'm sure Dr. Ling is thrilled to see that her method is yielding results, although I can tell that Dr. Cornell isn't thrilled with what he's seeing. We attempted 37 with housefly cells again. I expected promising results given the unique hybrids that samples 1 through to 35 have yielded. I suppose I do understand his concerns though. We still have not made any strides in singling out specific traits. I overheard him yelling at Dr. West for playing God. But I think he was being a little unfair. I'm aware that some have questioned the ethics of our experiments here, but I also think that this has been blown out of proportion. Once we've finished, we could save lives, regrow limbs. The big picture is incredible once you step back to admire it properly. Dr. Cornell is forgetting about that. On subject 37, they've come out much different than the late sample Delta. While Delta developed fly-like traits, 37 seems to be more of a hybrid. These rats were born with less fur and harder skin, more like a carapace. There is no larval stage and I have noticed that the rats needed to shed their own carapace as they got older, but they're still fascinating to watch. And Dr. Ling managed to get a blood sample and has been examining their blood cells. The change is drastic. Our work in theory is that we've effectively reprogrammed the brain to think it is a fly, and so it modifies the body as such. Of course, the brain can only do so much, but considering how far we have come, I'm still impressed. We'll be meeting with General Hughes tomorrow to present our findings. I'm sure he'll be impressed, and hopefully he'll prove our moving to porcine tests. Day 121 Dr. Cornell and Dr. West had another argument today. He's adamant that we wait for our porcine subjects to gestate, and we should try and isolate individual genes. He's right, although his attitude needs some severe adjustments. Dr. Cornell seems to be adamant that we are running some sort of freak show here. I don't think he understands just how important these freaks are to our research. We need to document everything and every failed experiment. Every freak is just another step closer to the ultimate goal. I don't understand how he continues to fail to grasp that. I have nothing but the utmost respect for Dr. Cornell, but his attitude is getting annoying, to say the least. Dr. West agreed to work towards isolating the desirable traits, though, as it seems that we're staying with the rats until the pigs have gestated. I suppose I can live with that. Hopefully, it will shut Dr. Cornell up for now. Day 217 Our first litter of modified piglets was born today. Seems to be the litter from sample 58. These were the ones injected with axolotl cells. If I had my way, I'd be testing them immediately. But Dr. Ling is adamant that we give them a few months before 
We start chopping off limbs. Well, I suppose I have to wait. It's promising to see that the piglets do have external gills of a axolotl, at least. I'll be interested to see how they fare aquatically. Our efforts to isolate certain traits have remained fruitless. Dr. Cornell is understandably frustrated, but he must know that we are doing all we can. He's called for the halt on all further testing until we can isolate the genes, but I've petitioned Dr. West to deny his request. We can't just shut down our operations on account of one little glitch. I fear that Dr. West is starting to side with Dr. Cornell, though. She said that our current state, we cannot advance beyond porcine trials. And that's utter nonsense. We should be able to work on primates by now. Hell, we should have human trials cleared within the year. I don't feel like arguing with Dr. West about this, but I disagree with her notion that we are moving too fast. Let's see what we can do with this. Day 291 Our porcine samples have continued to grow and continue to impress. Sample 58 can indeed regrow limbs as intended, and sample 65 is an especially interesting case. Back when we were adding the cells in vitro, I requested that we combine some cells. I chose to combine the arachnid and corvid cells. A controversial choice, I know, but I wanted to see how sample 65 fared under certain tests. Now that the pigs have matured a little more, I have been able to do that. Their hunting ability is actually quite spectacular. The subjects are primary carnivorous and are excellent ambush hunters. And while they can't exactly produce large webs, they found other use for their webbing and use it to map out their hunting grounds so they can determine where their prey is. Then they go for it. Seems that they are a more social creature and operate as a single unit. They really are fascinating. I've shared my findings with General Hughes and I'm sure he'll see a military application for this. The pigs are fairly territorial and more active at night. I am still unsure if they can be trained, but even if they can't, I'd hate to be stuck in their territory, considering what they did to the goat I let loose into their enclosure earlier today. It would be an absolute bloodbath. Dr. Cornell is disgusted by my experiments with Sample 65, and he's convinced Dr. West to shut down all further porcine tests and divert almost all resources to isolating traits. How do neither of them see the obvious application here? We can create whatever we want. General Hughes already seems to be satisfied with Sample 65. Why not proceed in that direction? We can fuck around with isolating traits later. Right now, we have something we can sell, and if we can sell it, that's more funding for us. I understand the importance of isolation, but it won't mean a damn thing unless we can maintain funding. We're getting close to our yearly review, and we need to show them something. Why aren't they considering military applications? Day 318 General Hughes and I have had a long discussion about potential applications for our recent work. Sample 65 have continued to perform efficiently, and I have the General's interest. That said... He seems to be interested in something a little meatier. We've elected to exclude Dr. West and Dr. Cornell from our current discussion. They would not like what we are looking into. But General Hughes has promised me solid funding for the next ten years if I can produce something viable for him. I know that I can. He has given me access to three human embryos and an artificial womb. They will be arriving prior to the end of the year. I'll utilize the arachnids, wolf spider, and corvid mix I used for sample 65. At the general's request, though, I've also included crustacean and a second set of arachnid cells, emperor scorpion. This one will have to stay off the books. I'll utilize the lab on a fourth sub-level. It's usually only Dr. Ling and I down there, and no one will think too much on our little project. The fewer questions people ask, the better. Day 318 the project, down on the fourth sub-level, I've taken to calling it Subject Nephilim, grows at a rate I've never seen before. It hasn't even been born yet, and it still seems like it's larger than a standard human infant. A side effect of the other cells, perhaps. I wonder if it might birth itself sooner than expected, and perhaps this hybrid was far too ambitious. If so, it might not survive. 
I still have two other embryos on ice, but I'll see how this pans out first. Dr. West and Dr. Cornell claim they've finally made some headway on isolating traits. They bred a batch of mice with COVID levels of intelligence and without the feathers or dark coloration. I think that's admirable, although tensions are still high between myself and Dr. Cornell. Dr. West hasn't said anything, but I'm beginning to wonder if she suspects that I've been dealing with General Hughes behind her back. During our yearly review, Hughes said nothing about Sample 65 or my little side project, but you could have cut the tension in the air with a knife. There's no doubt that she mistrusts him, and I can't help but find that extremely naive. General Hughes paid for this facility. He's given us way more than those stupid fucking suits from the pharmaceutical companies. This is more of a military op than anything else, and yet she acts like she's angry that the military is involved. Did she not expect them to try and find some sort of military application for our work? For such an intelligent person, Dr. West is a complete idiot. Regardless, I'll continue to work on my own little side project. Considering its growth rate, I hope to have something that I can present to General Hughes soon. The Nephilim is getting larger by the day. It is only a matter of time until it emerges. Day 347 The Nephilim emerged today and Dr. Ling is dead, along with many of her research aides. I had left her in charge for the morning while I attended a meeting with Dr. West and Dr. Cornell. We were discussing resuming porcine trials. I'll admit, I may have had a glass of champagne with them as well, despite the dirty looks that Dr. Cornell was giving me. I got back shortly after I finished my lunch and I was not expecting a scene laid out before me. I'd only been gone for a modest two hours and came back to a bloodbath. Six dead in total, and not just dead, torn apart. The artificial womb had been cut open from the inside. Dr. Ling was barely recognisable amongst the bodies. She had been torn in half and partially eaten. And there was evidence that the subject escaped into the facility, although it's proven difficult to track. Upon discovery of the bodies, I alerted Dr. West and she wasn't exactly pleased to find out that I'd been working with Dr. Hughes behind her back, but at least she saw the bigger problem. She was kind enough to play back the security footage from the room for me. I watched from the camera as Subject Nephilim emerged from its artificial womb. It had grown engorged and swollen over the past few months and was on the verge of breathing. Dr. Ling had been watching when the womb broke open and spilled amniotic fluid all over the floor. Subject Nephilim appeared disorientated and woozy at first. Dr. Ling did not approach it, and now that I see what emerged from that womb, I do not blame her. It was only vaguely humanoid in shape, but otherwise there was nothing human about it. Perhaps the shape of its skull was close enough to human, although it seemed to jut out at the creature's face. The skin either did not cover most of the skull, or was so thin and pale that it barely mattered. Either way, its face was skeletal. The pale, spiny carapace defined much of the rest of its body, no doubt a gift from the crustacean cells in it. It had a bony, segmented tail similar to that of a scorpion and long dagger-like fingers. It was truly horrifying to look at in every sense of the word. Subject Nephilim looked at Dr. Ling before letting out a noise, and there was no audio, but watching that skull let out some sort of scream or hiss was no less chilling without the audio. And then it ran for her. Dr. Ling only had time to stumble back before it ripped her apart with ease. Beside me, Dr. West placed her hands to her mouth as she watched the carnage unfold on her computer screen. I could feel her eyes on me, cold and judging, and I knew that I deserved it. I watched as Subject Nephilim slaughtered everyone in the room. It took mere seconds, and then it paced about. It fed on Dr. Ling's remains before finding its way to the door and fleeing. Dr. West stared at the empty room on the screen in quiet horror. It was a horror that I myself felt, and I only barely heard her when she asked me. What have you done? The facility is locked down, and we have requested armed personnel to come and examine the situation. Subject Nephilim should be dead by tomorrow. Dear God, I hope it is. Dr. West's question is not one that I can answer. I don't know what I brought into this world but it was not something that should have ever been made. Day 348 
subject Nephilim tore through the soldiers that we requested like they were nothing. Supposedly they discovered it on sub-level 3 and engaged it there. One of the technicians who escaped told me they heard gunfire and screams. Aside from a few technicians though, no one ever came back up. We used the link to the security cameras in Dr. West's office to take a look through the cameras on that level. All we saw was blood and shredded corpses, no sign of subject Nephilim. We have sealed sub-level 3 off, and we hope that this will stop the creature from getting closer to us. We are missing 13 members of staff, not counting Dr. Ling and her team. Though Dr. West and Dr. Cornell have said nothing, I know that they blame me, and they are right for that. Dr. Cornell has not said a word to me, but the look in his eyes tells me everything. This is my fault. Day 349 Two members of the staff were killed on sub-level 2. Subject Nephilim has been sighted. We are falling back to the ground level and sealing off sub-level 1. The elevator has been shut down. The only way up is in the stairs and those are blocked off. There should be no way that Subject Nephilim can get up here. And Dr. Cornell has advised that Dr. West call for an evacuation, but she's concerned that Subject Nephilim will make it up to here and use it to get back to Burlington. After all, it should not have been able to make it up to sub-level 2. He still isn't talking to me. Dr. West barely says a word. I've spent most of my time in my office, and we tried to contact the outside, but they share Dr. West's concerns. They cannot risk escape of subject Nephilim. I don't understand why they won't help us, though. We could evacuate long before that fucking thing gets up here. Would it not be wiser to just evacuate than burn the island? Demolish the lab and bury it beneath the rubble. That's what we should be doing. We can't stay here forever. I can't stay here. The staff know that I was responsible for this. I've spent most of my time cooped up in my office just to avoid their whispers and stares. They know that it was me who got Dr. Ling and the others killed. They know that it was me and my stupid secret project. We've got to get out of here. I've got to get out of here. Day 350 General Hughes said that he wanted an enhanced soldier. He wanted something beyond human, natural body armor and the power to decimate entire squadrons, but with the intellect of a human. I'm sure he'd be glad that he got what he wanted. No one is responding to our calls for help. I don't even think they're hearing us anymore. We're stuck here. We're fucking trapped and I think I know why. General Hughes wants to know if his monster works. It does. We're sitting ducks and it's on a top level now. Nobody's seen it but three people have gone missing. Dr. West has checked her camera feed and it's gone. It's loose on the island somewhere, free to hunt us and pick us off at its leisure, unless we kill it first. I don't know how we'll manage that. We are a research outpost. We're scientists, not soldiers. And even then, Subject Nephilim made short work of those fucking soldiers, didn't it? I don't know what to do. I'm so scared. I think we're all going to die because I don't know how to stop this thing. It was made to be unstoppable, a perfect hunter and killer. And we're just fish in a barrel. I tried to sleep earlier. I could hear it somewhere on the island. Somebody far away screamed and I heard this sound. It seemed to echo deep inside my skull. It was like an engine starting. A strange mix between a hiss and a roar. It was one of the most terrible sounds that I've ever heard in my life. The Nephilim has claimed another life, and I don't want to see who it is now. I don't want to leave my office, and the door is locked. Not that it'll do me much good. Day 351 At least three more people died last night. A bunch of others have tried to swim for the mainland. I don't think they'll make it. There's less of us. And Dr. Cornell was still here, as is Dr. West. And she's trying to keep morale up, but I think that all of us realize just how fucked we are. I can't look anyone in the eye. And when they die, not if, when. It will be my fault. Maybe I should swim for land. It would be better than staying here and waiting for it to come. Day 352 Dr. Cornell came to my office today. I could see the rage in his eyes. 
Five had been killed earlier, and the fucking Nephilim took off without a trace. It truly is an efficient killer. No one has actually gotten a good look at it yet. Not really. It comes and goes in a flash. I didn't fight back as Dr. Cornell hit me. And God, I probably deserved the beating that I got. My ears were ringing. I saw stars and I could barely have defended myself if I tried. This is on you! He snarled. All of this! You killed them! And he was right. And there was not a word I could say in my defense. Part of me hoped that he would kill me. It would be a better way to die than to meet my fate at the hands of that Nephilim. I've seen the way it tears its victims apart over and over again. Instead, though, Dr. Cornell let me live. Instead, he dragged me out of my office. You don't get to cause this and hide in your office like a fucking coward, he said. Not when we're all fucking dying out here. I just sniveled and whimpered like a child. I was a little bit surprised when I saw Dr. West running towards him. Gary, what the fuck are you doing? She asked. Giving this little bastard what he deserves, Martha. He made this goddamn thing. The least he can do is look at the people he's killed and tell them why they had to die. If I could have spoken, I don't think I would have been able to do that. The idea of looking at strangers in the eye and telling them that I'd let them die for money was more than I could stomach. And Dr. West just pulled me out of Dr. Cornell's grasp. Pull yourself together. Look at yourself, she said. I barely listened as she scolded him. Instead, I looked at the others around me, starving employees who were already weakened and exhausted. I realized that we'd been stranded for almost a week and food was running low. Morale was non-existent and we were basically already dead. And then I heard it. Closer than before, the rumbling hiss. My blood turned to ice in my veins. I didn't see it coming, but I heard it. From wherever it had been hiding, it appeared behind Dr. Cornell, and I could see the fear in his eyes as he began to turn around before it tore his head clean off. That look of fear was still on his face, and I realized that he was still alive. His brain was still functioning, even though it would not be for long. I could hear people screaming as my own adrenaline took over. I rose to my feet and ran for my office, hoping to escape its wrath. I remember just looking back and watching it as it stood over the newly disemboweled corpse of Dr. West and pursued some of the other stragglers. As it left her, I saw Dr. West's eyes on me and watched as she reached out for me, but I was too far away to help her, and she was too far gone to help anyways. I instead, I locked myself back into my office, crying like a fucking child as I listened to the screams outside, followed by silence just silence. I think I might be the last one alive. I think the Nephilim is out there waiting for me. I'm not getting out of here, am I? I can't hold out until help arrives. My office has no food and I'm so hungry. If there's anything left in the cafeteria, I would need to go through the Nephilim to get it. And no matter what I do, I think I'm going to die. I hear it. It's outside the door. It is looking for me. Perhaps it has already found me and is simply trying to figure out how to get through the door. Given enough time, I'm sure it'll find a way. I'll put this away now. No need to keep it waiting. No entity matching the description of the subject Nephilim was found on at the Lake Champlain facility. Although video footage recovered from the scene does support this account, of the events that happened. Subject Nephilim was later recorded entering the waters of the lake and departing to an unknown destination. Its current location is unknown. Wow, wow, wow. Awesome stuff there. Fantastic secret government testing lab story there. Absolutely love those kind of stories. Thank you ever so much once again to the awesome author, Head of Spectre, Please do take time to go over to the Reddit and leave a upvote or leave a comment giving your regards and thanks for their wonderful, wonderful work. As ever, guys, please do let me know down below in the comments what you thought. Please do like and share. It really, really does help build the channel and our community further. And of course, don't forget to hashtag Team Fear. I hope you're all well and happy and have had a wonderful, warm weekend. And above all, 
remember, be safe, not sorry.